Hi guys, Shalom. how do you feel? Great, perfect. So I'd like to ask uh, the first question about the language. So there are a lot of people who work in IT, but they don't speak English. How do you feel about this? I feel that we need to improve the situation. At some point in my life, I work on the front end of the magazine that actually, I hope, help a little bit with it. But the situation is still quite sad. So people learn English. It will help you to be best front enders than you are now. Yeah, I agree. The only thing I can say that I always Google in English. So if I have Googled in Russian, I wouldn't have found anything I need to work. <laughs> so it's essential. Yeah, right. Uh, Anton, how did you come up with the talk topic? Well, I just solved my particular problem about which I will told, tell you soon enough. Okay. Um, when you surf the internet, you probably see the websites uh, that just force you to register or log in to continue watching the content on the website. So, do you do this or you leave the website? <laughs> it uh, highly depends on why I am on this site. But yes, I for sure don't like to share my private data with uh, sites I don't, well, really need. And if I can get something without committing to anything or making any actions, I would prefer to do so. I'm usually open in DevTools, just removing the pop-up with login and <laughs> continue surfing. <laughs> usually it's not. <laughs> this is tricky. Yeah. I would say it's quite a rare situation, actually. <laughs> if they hide something behind the authorization, well... Uh, it depends. You should take it or leave it. Yeah, you're right. It's usually for, like, subscribe for some content, leave your email. Ah, uh, yes. I just use Adblocker to block this or, yes, use DevTools. Yeah, this is why it's good to be a developer. <laughs> Front-end developer. So, I'm not sure that back-end Java developers can know how to use DevTools in Chrome. Okay. So I'm curious to know what you have to say. So good luck. I have one more question before you start the talk. Uh, did you did you like the auth process in HolyJS website? The latest website you logged in? I would in? say it could be improved. Really? Organizers? Yes, organizers, that's for sure. Organizers, hear us? Yeah? Listen to this talk, please, and write down the things you can do better. Okay, Anton, I'm really curious to know what can be improved. Everything. Then any. let's start with it. Cool. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, holy jazz. Let's talk about perfect authentication flow. What problem I'm talking about? Well, while researching our main customer flow, I found out that a quarter quarter of customers just drop on authentication step. I see this, there's great opportunity to improve our conversion. That's quite a real chart that was based on feedback collected from users that decide to leave the flow. As you see, it's quite a lot. But why they are leaving? Why do they not want to share their private data? Uh, there could be multiple reasons. Not enough trust, or maybe not enough information, or, well, it's just plain too complex. Trust is important thing. Users should think they, it's safe to use your service. And it's quite understandable. At last year report, last pass, shows that uh, each password you used approximately 13 times. 
So when user enters a password in your service, you gain a lot of trust. And well, it's the same for me. I prefer not to do it. <laughs> How we can improve trust? Well, show ratings, show reviews. Make sure that you are responsible and available in media channels and well, use micro formats. Not, uh, well, only micro formats per se, but uh, for example, schema, any kinds of additional data you can add. Well, this is example of use of the schema. It add a um, nice widget with the stars in the Google search query. And I was actually amazed to see it works. After we have used schema to add this kind of widgets, we gain more trust and this cut a share of customers leave the flow. Surprise. Transparency. It's also important. Explain. Why do you need information and how you are planning to use it? And how you wouldn't use it? We add copies that explains that we don't share customer contact data with anyone until the customers explicitly willing to share them with service professionals. And that improves situation quite a bit. Copy do matter. Uh, also, just as an example, in one of our experiments, we decided to postpone the user phone number request until we should pass it to service professional. And it's also helped quite a bit. And uh, well, all forms should be simple. If they are not, well, user can just skip them because it's too complex to fill. I personally believe that web based on three technologies, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Also, I believe in progressive enchantment. So let's start from HTML and see how we can iterate from there. And to start with, Let's talk about forms. Which one? When we talk about authentication, it usually would be registration, login, and password recovery forms. So that would be main parts of the flow that well relate to authentication. But what could help us to improve forms? Semantic, as usual. Use form element. Even if you send data with JavaScript and don't actually send the form, form elements uh, can be used, for example, for grouping, allowing to use form data properly. Use button elements. And uh, don't forget to specify proper button type. Remember then when user press enter while input some focused field, he de facto press the first child submit button in the form. And this could matter a lot if you have more than one submit button. Yes, the situation can actually happen. Remember about field set and legend elements. Before, we have problems with uh, legend stylization, but this time long gone. If you are actually interested to keep structure, you even can use titles uh, inside the legend. So just drop H1 or H2 there if needed, and it would work fine. And use labels and inputs that uh, correspond to your need. Don't forget to add placeholders, which actually show an example of, well, data you can in enter there. 
place holder, don't replace labels. It's totally different things. Have this in mind. What else? We can use attributes. Attributes this allow us to prevent autocorrection and autocapitalize. Well, you wouldn't want email to be autocapitalized and spell checked, right? Aside from that, remember about input mode and autocomplete attributes. They would allow us to see how to uh, input and autocomplete work. So, for example, we have this kind of input modes that uh, allow people more easily enter data with skateboard on their phones. And you know how hard can be use skateboard on the phone, so it is important. Autocomplete allow browser to make you some suggestions and that could actually save a lot of time. So correct autocomplete attribute is essential things for forms that actually work. And let's start, for example, with registration flow. What can be user? Perhaps you will need to enter email, right? Use input mode email and autocomplete email. This will lead to next station. On the left, you see how it looks like on iPhone. You focus on email and you have emails that uh, browser know about. You just need to click on one. When you use Android, first, you will be proposed to fill whole form from the start, all fields. And if you wouldn't want to, when you would uh, focus input, you will have separate suggestions depending on the well, input type and autocomplete value. Of course, we have this on desktop and I guess all of you see that more than once. Autocomplete new password. When you actually uh, fill in the registration form, perhaps you would need uh, you would ask a customer to enter a new password. And on iOS, it would look like this. If you have specific autocomplete value, then you will be proposed to use strong password. Uh, on iOS, it's just really good password that you can optionally save or maybe write on a piece of paper. But on Android, it gives you quite a benefit. You can in the same way used to use suggested password, but it would be saved automatically. And it works for any Chrome browser you will use. So user don't need to choose. It would be saved. Yes, it works on desktop. Perfectly fine, I would say. in flow. Then, perhaps uh, you will need to fill current password, right? So, in the iOS, it looks like this. When you focus on the password, you are selecting the related account and password will be filled. On the Android situation, same as with new password. You first propose to fill the all form and then you can select the password from the list. And yes, 
It definitely works on desktop. Uh, but what about OTP, one-time passwords? We can use input mode and autocomplete for that too. If you would send SMS in the specific format that actually have code, some text, and on the last line, add domain, space, then hash and code, then perhaps you would be able to use autocomplete. All of these SMS would work for iOS. And this looks like this. Just ordinary autocomplete suggestion, despite this number was taken from the SMS. Cool, right? But that's not it. In the phone, we have text message forwarding option. It's on by default. And if you pay one, at least once phone to the desktop, and so, well, phone trust this desktop, then on desktop, then on desktop, you for sure would uh, be able to see an autocomplete too, which is very, very, very nice, I would say. Ever use it? So, let's continue. How exactly SMS parsed on iOS? Eh, it's boring. It just look for words, code, and passwords that located next to the numbers. But it's kind of old style. Now we have better ways. Chrome and Android sadly don't have declarative approach to OTP autocomplete. But uh, as Google usually do, they provide even better way, which we will discuss a bit later. This is standard for SMS that we could use nowadays. Both Google, Apple uh, actually accepted it and it's supported by multiple other companies like Microsoft, for example. And that's exactly the format I described from the start. When on the, you can have some text and on the last line, you have to add at domain and hash code, which is quite good, I would say. Feel free to watch this Apple presentation related to the OTP password subject. And please check our HTML standard to see all possibilities for autocomplete because I just touched the surface. There is a lot of other things there. Feel free to actually buy and read this beautiful form from Smashing Magazine about form design patterns. It's awesome. I read it myself and I can recommend it. But, well, autocomplete. Where it take this data? How browser know our passwords, our addresses and all this stuff? Well, you actually give all this data up by yourself. All modern browsers have functionality to save your credentials and even more addresses and payment methods and store them inside, if you allow them to, of course. This would be an example. You fill form, you submit it, you see some kind of pop-up that allow you to save the form and, well, most of us just click yes, because it's annoying and because it may be useful. But here is the tricky part. 
don't forget the names of the input. It's actually important. All of us develop React application or, well, some kind of SPA. We don't usually send forms anymore. We just, well, collect the information from ref and uh, use some kind of fetch, for example, to send our data on a server. And we rarely create fallbacks that would work if, for example, page is loaded without JavaScript. Despite sometimes it's really easy and usually it would be a good idea having in mind that bundles can be large and they not load it instantly. So, well, there is temptation to skip the name attribute. It's a real code that I find on one of the pages in my uh, project at Workspot. But there is a problem. What's wrong on the screenshot? See username. It's a phone number. Not email. How come? Well, if you don't set the names, then Chrome and Firefox search for a field with autocomplete username. And if there are none, it just use first field before the password. That's why we get Fonzer. Safari act a little bit wiser. It search for autocomplete username, then autocomplete email, and only then switch to the field that go before the password. There is kind of hint, so we can, for example, use autocomplete username and email in the same time for the email input, and it would fix the situation in Chrome, but, well, just use names. I beg you. It's not a problem. In the settings, you can see all autofill data. So you see password, payment method, addresses, and when you enter some options, you see everything that browser know about you. You can manage this data and, well, you even can add your own one. And it's actually worth time spending because when you fill it once, fully correct, or your forms that require address would be filled in instant. And that's awesome. But what about data synchronization? For example, we have Google Password Manager. In Firefox, we have Firefox Lockwise. And of course, on Macs, we have iCloud Keychain. If you logged in in one of these accounts and use it on another devices, all this data would be synchronized across devices. So you will have all your addresses and passwords and payment methods on both desktop and mobile, which can be kind of awesome. So Google Password Manager. Select <laughs> your account. In the security tab, you actually see Password Manager. And so, well, you see all passwords there feel free to check this up. In the logwise, you can select login and passwords. And while you actually logged in in the logwise account, which provided by Mozilla, you can manage your password there. And of course, iCloud Keychain. Well, it's preferences of the Safari, open passwords, and you will see them there. For iOS, you actually can manage sources for autocomplete from multiple places. Uh, you get all the data from 
iCloud keychain by default. But aside from that, you can add one additional source. It could be Chrome, well, Google account or Mozilla Lockwise account. For some unobvious reason, it can uh, you can actually select only one of them. But uh, that's great that you can combine iCloud with other sources. But we can do even better password change. You see, Chrome, for example, and some other browsers do a security check on all passwords you stored. It can find compromised passwords. And then you will see change password button. By default, when you click it, you'll just get to the domain related to compromised password, usually the home page. We can improve that. Is well-known standard. You can create endpoint, well, no change password. The only purpose of this endpoint redirect you to place when where you can well change password. This is snippet for the Fastify or for example ExpressJS that will do that. This one is for Nginx, just a couple of lines and uh, user will be redirected to the page where he can actually change password. I believe it's a good idea. Endpoint should return 302, 303 or 307 code. Then browser would actually do the redirect. It works the same, for example, in the Safari. Just click change password and you will get there. Check out this well-known <laughs> standard. This nice RFC proposes a lot of totally awesome features. But now when our HTML is improved quite a bit, let's discuss JavaScript and how we can use it. we will talk about credential management specification. And this one is really special. It's extendable. Navigator credentials is root object for everything. And it provides us with just four plain methods. Create allow us to build credential object. Store allow us to store it to the browser and get, well, get data bed. Prevent silent access will switch off silent login functionality and we would discuss it a bit later. So what kinds of credentials do we have? Password credentials with essentially just login and password. Federated credentials, which is all kind of social logins. Facebook Connect, uh, Google Login, wherever. OTP credential, which allow us to work with SMS. And this would be an extension I mentioned before. And public key credential, which you all perhaps know up as WebHouse N. Because it's extendable specification, basic web credential specification, just contain password credential and federated credentials. OTP credential and public key credentials is separate specifications. Let's start with the password credentials because it's, well, simplest and great to start with. It allows you to authentication with login and password. And that's an example of how it works. Yes, Twitter actually using that. So you logged in, uh, something happens then, and uh, you lost all your cookies. But you still have passwords in the browser. 
or maybe it's a couple of months past before your last login, and you, well, you log in automatically without any additional actions, despite all your cookies is long lost. That give you a nice potential for improved UX, right? The basic object for credentials called credential data and only provide property ID that identify credential. Yes, all objects described in specification are also extendable. <laughs> when we talk about password credential, it extends previous object and add fields on the top of that. Name, icon, password, and type password. So, for example, we filled our registration form, we submit it, and when actually submission is confirmed, we can create credential directly from, from form object. So, pass password and as a value, the form itself, the moment. Navigator credentials with deal with it perfectly fine. We can make it a bit shorter by using password credential uh, as a shortcut. And then if you use strong password, password would be just saved without any questions to the user, without any interaction. And that's awesome. But uh, if user prefer to use the oven password, then he would see the confirmation pop up and also can save that. But can we do even better than that? Yes, we can. We have form element, but from form element, we can create a form data. And if password credential is supported, we can create a custom object with this form data. Now we have full control over the data that we propose customer to save. We set our ID, name, password from the fields we are interested in, but there is an extra icon. We can pass icon, for example, user select a file upload for the avatar, right? And we can build image and pass it there. Why? That's why. This way we can have much nicer pop-up, both for signing in and for the case when user should select one of the users. Proper names, avatars, nice, right? No need to reinvent the wheel and create all this kind of stuff yourself. But we still need to find a way to use these credentials, right? And we should use get method for this. We would need to pass credential request options to do so. Mediation conception is critical for understanding how it would work. And let's discuss it on the examples. Signal is the same as signal from the fetch, and it allow you to, for example, drop request at any point by timeout or wherever. By the way, yes, you can do that with fetch too. So, password credential. We can distinct it by having inside password true. And this snippet would actually can be used on all pages of your site. You can put it to the header. If password credential is supported, we're trying to get credential with mediation silent. Mediation silent means that you will get credentials only if it's possible without bothering user. No questions will be asked. No interaction needed. If it's possible, 
you get credentials. If not, well, you will get null. Nothing bad happens. The pre-requirements for mediation silent working you have the credential for this origin. Second one, you have only one credential for this origin. And third and last one, you didn't call prevent silent access before it. Prevent silent access is another concept we will discuss a bit later. But what happens there? Well, you silently request credentials, and if you have one, you can authenticate user without any actions from his side. When you get a credentials inside, you get essentially the data we saved there: ID, name, icon, password, and type password. Type password is quite important one because if, for example, you don't specify which kind of credentials you get, here we have password true, and that means that we want password credentials, but we also may add federated or any other kinds, it's the same time. You will get only one credential object and you need to understand which one. So if you authenticate it, you just see pop up like you can see on the screen. And that's it, you're authenticated. But also we have mediation optional for the cases when we can use silent one. Usually use mediation optional when user explicitly shows that he wants to log in. For example, he click login button. Then, then if, if you would be able to get credential uh, without any actions from the user side, you will just get it and can silently authenticate user. But if you cannot do that, so essentially silent don't work, pop-up will be shown and user will have to select from the list of credentials that he have for this origin or just confirm that he won't to log in. Uh, why you can have a list of the accounts for the region. Uh, just an example. Workspot is a service which connect person who need some kind of home services. Well, watch the windows, for example. And a service pro who could help you with it. But you can be boss. You can watch windows. And for example, you need some person to fix your stuff. And then you will have both account, customer and service pro on the same origin. And you will have to choose one of them to log in. That's look like this in a very naive way. A list of accounts and you just click on one of them then script will get credential object and can log you in. The, this would end well, the same way. And also it would not show a pop-up if it can do it silently. But what prevent, about prevent silent access? Well, for example, you are logged in, right? You click log out. Because maybe you are using this on the public place. You logged in in the public library or wherever, or on your sister's laptop. You don't want your account to be exposed and maybe accidentally misused. If we just logged in, browser still have the credentials <laughs> and we log you back automatically. To prevent that, we have prevent silent access, which block silent login. So when you log out, run prevent silent access, and then mediation silent wouldn't work. 
users will have to take some actions to log back. But why all this is so awesome? Why I'm so excited about that? Because of cross-platform logging. You see, sometimes you, for example, register on the service on a desktop. But then you willing to continue use the service on your mobile application or any other one, right? On the mobile, well, even if uh, if you have proper autocomplete, it's a bit cumbersome to log in. But your accounts are actually being synchronized between devices, right? So browser will have all your passwords internally. And if you are logged in on a desktop, you open this site on a mobile and you will be authenticated automatically without any actions. You can see a blue pop-up on the bottom of the screen. It just work. It just authenticated on all platforms that, uh, well, you have. Awesome, right? Federated credential is next type of credentials. Uh, we would not dive deep into that. It's very similar to how password credential work. It just provides a couple additional fields. Provider and protocol that actually allow you to identify which authentication provider you need to use. So for example, you have a Facebook social login. You see in provider that it's actually Facebook social login and use the credentials ID, first of all, to authenticate user with Facebook Connect API. It nice. What about support of all these night nice features? Well, it's Blink. It's a bad news. The good news, Blink is actually 75% of all, well, devices. So essentially, it for sure worth time that you can spend on implementing that. But what about other browsers? Hmm. Firefox considering it. And I believe we would have it soon. But what about WebKit and iOS? Well, because there is no signals, I just go and ask. Jeff and Tan, which work, for example, on uh, WebAuth N for iOS, answer that probably not in a short term. But still, if you would actually use it and ask Apple developers for it, then maybe it would get different priority and it would happen in the end. So just use it. This would help to make web better. Feel free to read specification on credential management. Uh, and an article on the Fab Fundamentals. Both of them not very long and very insightful. But let's talk about Web OTP API. OTP credentials. That's exactly the way how we would do it on the Android and Google Chrome. Yes, we cannot use autocomplete for OTP in declarative way, but that way is better. If you have OTP credential object in Windows, we can use get credentials with OTP transport. It will give you code that was in the SMS without uh, any delay, and you can just fully drop the screen when user can enter the OTP which is kind of awesome. It's do a step less. 
That's an example. Uh, I sent SMS that you see on the left side to the emulator of Android device that you can say it on the right side. And you, I immediately see the pop-up that ask uh, if I can actually use this SMS. If user will click yes, then you can automatically, well, approve password recovery or wherever and so don't make user enter anything, which is kind of awesome. Pre-requirements for using SMS on Chrome on Android, well, you should have a message containing 10 alphabetic numbers and at least one, well, 10 characters and at least one number. But uh, actually, you remember specification I mentioned before. This would be a way to go. Second requirement for Android would be you must send a message from a number that doesn't belong to any user contacts. This way, they guarantee that uh, any site in any way would not uh, be able to access your SMS. And that's a question of privacy. Makes sense, right? So, that's a fundamentals articles on how to use it. That's once again, specification for the SMS. And that's actually an article on web OTP API. But now let's talk about is logged in web API. Did you know we have it? <laughs> It's provide you with three methods, set logged in, set logged out, and is logged in. Uh, why, why do we want to have such kind of API? This way we can notify browser that users are actually authenticated and not, and that could matter when we talk about privacy and tracking and all this kind of stuff. But even more than that, now we use usually cookies to store the, uh, well, some kind of tokens. And that's not the best way. For different reasons, cookie can be cleaned, even by user maybe. But we wouldn't want to lose authentication in these cases. And this way we can keep it which is a good idea. But when I actually tried to use it, nothing worked. When I contact the specification authors, the answer was, well, it's not only under the flag, it's experimental implementation. And uh, these functions, they are dummies. So no code inside. First, they do these dummies, then they create a tests, for these dummies, and only then they actually write the code inside the methods. And we are still on the very early stage. So yes, we have the spec under the flag, but it doesn't work yet. Please let me know what do you think about this specification. It's, I find it curious, and maybe a quite a good idea. Read the specification yourself, and Let's talk about web house and at last public key credentials. This is another extension to our web credentials spec. And there's two types of this case. Cross-platform. Well, they look like this. Mine one is actually stored by the radical adword for me. It can be quite useful. For example, when you have kind of banks account, tax account, all this kind of government stuff, security is important. But we talk actually more about users UX. 
So maybe it's not the best way. By the way, in the near future, we would be able to use our phones like a replacement to these devices, which is great. And platform authentication. It's face ID, it's touch ID. And yes, it's not only Max. We have analogs on a Android devices. We have analog on Windows devices. It yes, it actually called Windows Hello. What would be a way we are using it? User register. Then we ask permission to use platform keys. If permission was given, we would get an ID which we would store in browser. And next time user visit and user is not authenticated, we check if we have this ID in the browser. If we do, we can once again authenticate user with this platform feature. When we say about, well, registration of the key on the server side, well, first we request some kind of challenge from the backend, then we pass this challenge to the sensor for face ID or touch ID, return the answer from the sensor, and send it back to the server. If the challenge would be valid, then we can well store ID and say, yes, user actually give us the face ID ID. We can use if it's there by well checking if public OK credential present in the window object or by well that's method. It's actually the longest method we have in JavaScript at the moment is user verifying platform authenticator available. Uh, oh my god. It's even worse than Aztec got Tescatli Poca. So let's go through the flow now, actually checking code. First, we register our client. We actually having name and mine, password, and we sending them to the server to get a challenge. On the server side, we would need to use some kind of leader library. Fido is an alliance that work on a, this kind of web credentials, both cross-platform and platform keys. Uh, and uh, there is standard related to that. You can find some libraries to work with the standard on web, house, and I.O. Some of them supported not that well, maybe. So I actually use Fido2 library, which fork of one of these um, libraries, and, uh, well, supported much better than that. It's quite easy to use it. You just require it and then initialize. Uh, you can pass as an options host, which would define origin, and that's an important one. Attestation, uh, if we would require additional super security, we can use certificates for that, and that would be attestation. Acetication user verification, that's another security feature. Uh, then, for example, when you use Touch ID or Face ID, you would also be asked to enter some kind of PIN code. We don't want that because our goal is better UX, right? Also, this feature don't properly work in the Firefox at the moment, so eh, not the best option anyway. 
and authenticator attachment, you can specify if you want only platform or only cross-platform identificator, or just keep it and use both. So then we create an endpoint for challenge for registration. We get data that was sent to us from the client and create attestation with the library. It will return us a lot of fields. I mark interesting and important one as read. And what import, more important, I mark two fields, ID and challenge, that would be returned as a buffer. The problem with buffer is that uh, it cannot be serialized with JSON. It's not a plain type. This is example of data we would get from the library. ID is essentially origin. You see some user data and very important user ID. And challenge that we would need to, well, check if this flow is working properly. To transfer them, we can use these two functions that will convert buffer to base 64 encoded string and back to buffer. So we take our challenge, we convert it to string, and for a start, we would store it in the session. Uh, it's only for test purposes. I would guess that uh, you will store it uh, in some specific table, in database, uh, in memory perhaps, that would be linked to the specific user. But that's uh, implementation details. <laughs> then we replace both buffer fields uh, with the proper one and send all data back to the client. When we get it, we transform this base64 encoded strings to a buffer, and then we create a public key credential by passing the object that we get from the server. And this object contains data about user, about origin, and our well, buffer case ID and challenge. Then users see something like that, and he can use either, well, he either his face, either his finger to identificate this. Have in mind that uh, data that browser get actually have nothing to do with uh, your face or, well, fingerprint. It's just a hash that created by the sensor with data collected from your face or finger as a salt. So no worries. But actually, there is one interesting thing. Remember, I mentioned that you can use phone as a uh, well key. And if your phone have some kind of sensor and your laptop don't, that's maybe an option. We have under the flag cable specification, it's form of Bluetooth connection to your phone. And if you turn this on, that one of the possible keys would be phone. When a browser allowed to use multiple types of keys, you have a pop-up where you can choose which one you prefer. And if you choose phone, you will see this kind of QR code that can be scanned by Android devices. Actually, not quite. <laughs> you need to build your own browser and install it on your phone to do that. And I wouldn't able to make it work. But soon, soon, it would really be an option. So, yes. Cable still in the development, and we will have it soon. On the iPhone, you will see a screen like this. Once again, you will be allowed to 
either use Face ID, either maybe a security key. And when you will use it, you will see some kind of icon and script get back credentials data from that. The same situation is on Android. Well, pop up, cover all the screen, but that's one different, I would say. This example of the answer you get from the sensor. And you just mostly need it to send to the client and store. So once again, we form the object that we would send to the server, transform data that need it to the base64 strings, so all buffers. Make sure it's in the station object and send it to the register endpoint. Let's see what would happen there. But when actually registration would be confirmed, we just need to store credential ID that we would get to server and with which we would later log in. So that would be the register endpoint. We get our challenge from the session or database. When we build assertion with the use of this challenge and a data that we send from the client. Then we run attestation function from the library. And if challenge is correct and everything works fine, you will get counter, which show how many times you log in with these credentials, credential ID, and well, public key. Then we store it in the database, register the key, and send back the credential ID that uh, we would store in the browser. How we would log back in with use of this ID? First of all, we would check if we have credential ID in our browser saved. Then we would request a challenge once again to prevent fraud from the server. Pass credential ID to the sensor and to get some answer, hopefully. Then send this answer to the server and make sure that challenge was correct. And if is correct, that essentially means that user authenticated. So you can return either some kind of token that shows that you authenticated either maybe uh, just return 204 that says that everything fine forever. In the current terms of code, it would look like that. Checking if you have credential ID in the local storage. If not, well, nothing bad happens, we just stop. Uh, create challenge, but now for the logging, essentially it would be more or less the same process. So we have kind of login endpoint. We make an assertion that return us uh, a challenge and send this challenge to the client, obviously, after transforming uh, the buffer to a string and storing it to the session so we can compare it, or in the database. On a client, we receive it, deserialize it, get our credential ID from the local storage, and create options that we would pass to a credentials get. Then user would see once again this kind of pop-up. And if he already was using uh, the touch ID or face ID or wherever on this page, then, then uh, you will get object like this, which allow you to create new credential object encoded and after uh, 
forming an authenticator object, send it to the login endpoint. On a server, we get all these metrics from the session. And once again, build an assertion with use of the challenge, public key, and uh, amount of logins. After that, we use lib. After that, we using Libri to validate everything. And if everything's fine, just send back code 204. And then you can say that user authenticated. Where it's supported everywhere. So use it. It's quite awesome experience when you can authenticate with uh, use of face ID and touch ID on your site, and uh, it improves UX a lot. Also, notice you can debug web house N. Just open more options, web house N, and you will be able to create any authenticator of any protocol on transport and use it on your site while you're testing this feature. Check the demo application that uh, I actually use to show you how it works. Read this article about debugging everything. Read this curated list of awesome WebAusen and Fido2 resources. Read the guide that would help you to start faster. Read Introduction to WebAusen RP by Yuri Ackerman. And check the presentation of Face ID and Touch ID in the browser from the Apple and the article that's actually related to this presentation. Check how to use it in the Windows and how to enable strong authentication with WebAuth N in the Google articles. Check the Fido Alliance that actually work on the standard and Ubico which creates this totally awesome KISS state of art at the moment. Oof. Read specification, guys. There are a lot of them. And feel free to ask me all questions you want. I would be happy to answer. You can find me on Twitter, and that actually would be the best way to do it. Also, you can check the uh, presentation on a link below. That's all, guys. Oh, I muted myself. I muted myself. Thank you, Anton. Really, I learned so much. I just, during the talk, I went to my iPhone preferences and changed uh, password auto completion for my uh, third party app that stores passwords, have never knew there is such an option. Wow. <laughs> cool, very cool. Uh, I am amazed. Thank you. Like I never read the specification as deep as it's required. Thank you for <laughs> telling me. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have only two minutes left and I have one question. Tell me if we would have time to answer it right now or we should uh, move it to discussion zone. You mentioned the cross-platform authentication mm -hmm. feature. How does it work? How does it look like? I'm actually testing this feature. Oh, sorry. I'm actually uh, testing this feature now. It wouldn't work on your iPhone because uh, this part of specification does not support it on WebKit, but it's supported on Blink, so on Android devices. Let's see how it works. Uh, great. So, for example, it came to work spot NL, right? Are we sharing the screen? Mm -hmm. uh, now, well, I'm kind of logged in already. Great. Now give, give me a second to test all this stuff. I'm actually using Android emulator. So let's open Verkspot NL now on the phone. Uh, 
Okay. Oops, sorry. Uh, as you can see, we are not logged in. Mm -hmm. uh, question, did you see a previous part of the process when I open the emulator and all the stuff? Yeah, 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 yeah. We already Great. see the phone and we so, are not logged in. Great. So we are not logged in. That's kind of important. Uh, at that point, our phone has nothing to do with our account. But we can turn on Google account synchronization. Yes, I would like to turn it on. We wait for a bit. And now synchronization is actually turned on. Uh, okay, let's get back to our work spot. Spot.nl, enter. And now, if nothing would happen, watch it closely. Oop. I would say, wait. So I enter on some page and see, Below you see wow. a blue block that shows that you we are actually logged in now. Check the menu. Yes, I can see my, for example, well, uh, orders. Guys, and, I'm sorry. Uh, guys. Yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> that's we, all. We don't have we don't have much time, unfortunately. So I offer you and our viewers to jump to the discussion room and yeah. to continue showing this demo and to answer no, all that's the questions. All. I would be happy to do so. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you for the talk. <laughs> thank you. So, dear attendees, you can give this talk a thumbs up uh, to let us know the feedback and it will help our conference get better. <laughs>